this morning then, can I invite you to return to that verse as we read in Galatians chapter 6. We're going to look at that section from 11 to 18, the end of this epistle. And I hope this morning that this will draw our studies in the book of Galatians to a conclusion. The title I want to give to our meditation this morning is Real Christianity. Real Christianity. The Apostle Paul has been speaking to the Galatians. We know the real problem here. There were false teachers who came into these congregations and they were basically telling the new converts that they had to be circumcised in order to be saved. It was not enough simply to believe upon the Lord Jesus and to be justified by faith. They had to add to the work of Christ and they had to be circumcised. And as he explains in the letter, as we've looked through it, if you're circumcised, then you are obliged to obey the whole law. And what these Judaizers wanted to do was to make these people who were Gentiles to become Jews. And we might say in modern words and modern parlance, the Apostle Paul would have none of it because he recognized that this was another gospel and this was not the gospel that they had embraced. It was a gospel of grace plus works. While, while the Apostle Paul preached, it was a gospel of grace. The grace of God. You are what you are by the grace of God. You must look to the grace of God to save in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And in these verses we read, I put it to you that the Apostle Paul is talking here about real Christianity. Real Christianity. And he's asking or outlining two themes that are found in real Christianity. And if there's something that's needed today in the church and in the world, it is the declaration of what real Christianity is. And here we find it in he, this section as he seeks to sum up. He wants to emphasize this, and he wants to emphasize what real Christianity is. In verse 11, you see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. Now, it was normal for the Apostle Paul, when he wrote these letters, for him to dictate, and a secretary would write down what he dictated. And then at the very end of the letter, the Apostle Paul would write to authenticate that what was written was actually his letter, although he had not officially written the letter. He had simply dictated it. That was his normal practice. And some commentators maintain that's what he did here, that he wrote these verses from 11 to 18 in his own handwriting. I'm not sure if I accept that, because verse 11 says, Ye see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. I'm inclined to believe that the Apostle Paul wrote this letter himself. And now, at the end of it, he is writing with emphasis. He is, what we would say in modern Words he is underlining, or he is making bold these things from 11 to 18. He wants to end this letter, and he wants to emphasize something that's vitally important. That's the message he wants to draw to the Galatians, that they are to pay heed to this. And what they are to pay heed to is the fact that he's outlining here what real Christianity is. And he writes it 
boldly. He underlines it. He emphasizes it. He begins to use, as it were, larger letters so that it might stand out from the page. And the Apostle Paul, therefore, is emphasizing to these early Christians, this is it. Here is the heart of the matter. Grasp this, and you've got it in a nutshell, as it were. What is real Christianity? Well, I have two headings. Is real Christianity outward or inward? Is it external or internal? That's what he's emphasizing here. Or at least that's one thing he's emphasizing here under this heading as he outlines what real Christianity is. Is it outward or is it inward? The Judaizers were saying it's outward. It's in external forms. You must be circumcised. You must follow the law of Moses. You must become a Jew. To them, this was the sum and substance of their Christianity, of their profession. They were relying upon the works of the law, upon the works of the flesh. They were relying upon these external things. Now, these external things, particularly circumcision, was certainly given by God. It, de it definitely had God's approval. There's no doubt about it. He gave it to Abraham. But it was a sign and it was a seal of something else. Circumcision signified the cutting of the heart for sin. That's what it did. And circumcision in itself is not salvation. It's not. Now you may well be saying to me, as you should be saying to me, Minister, we're not involved in circumcision. That's true. We are not ones who practice circumcision. But as you know, the New Testament tells us that baptism has replaced circumcision. And we might be in danger of placing an importance upon baptism that's not found in the Scriptures. Baptism, like circumcision, is a sign and it is a seal of a covenant. Baptism symbolizes the washing of the soul by the Holy Spirit. Baptism symbolizes the work of the Holy Spirit in the individual, whereby that person is washed clean from his sins by the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what it signifies. And we can obviously open up and enlarge upon this. And we want to ask ourselves, what kind of Christianity have we got? Do we rely upon our baptism, good as it is? Do we rely upon attending the Lord's Supper, a sacrament that Christ has instituted for his people? Is that the sum and substance of our Christianity? Is it because we're a member of party or a member of another congregation? And as a result, we enjoy privilege, privileges that belong to membership. We have been baptized. We, have, we sit at the Lord's table. We are members. We attend a, an Orthodox church. The gospel is proclaimed there. We belong to an Orthodox denomination. We have purity of worship. We have a good Bible translation. Everything's fit and proper in its place. Is this our hope? Is this our sum and substance of our Christianity? Is it these outward things that in of themselves are good? Is this what we're resting upon? Well, friends, Christianity is more than these things. And we can have these things and still not be right with God. We can have these things and still not have real Christianity. This is the point. The Apostle Paul says, in verse 15, for instance, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. 
the Judaizers were placing their confidence upon circumcision. There may be a tendency upon others to say, well, we're not putting our trust upon circumcision. We're uncircumcised. And they're putting their trust in the fact that they're uncircumcised. Some can put their hope upon these externals, and some can put their hope in the fact that they don't have these externals. What's Paul's answer to them? We find it again in verse 15. But a new creature. Here Paul is telling them, circumcision doesn't matter. Circumcision will not save you. Uncircumcision will not save you. But what will save you? A new creature. What's he talking about? He's talking about the new birth, friends. That's what he's talking about. We go back to that conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus. Here was Nicodemus, the, the aged and the learned Pharisee, the teacher of Israel, a man of note, a man of renown, a man that you, you could go to to discuss religious things. And he comes to Jesus and he wants to engage in a topic. He wants to discuss Je with Jesus concerning the scriptures, concerning theology, concerning God. We know that thou art a teacher who has come from God, and so on. And Jesus cuts him off and says, Ye must be born again. That's what he says to him. And that is, in essence, what the Apostle Paul is saying here. This is what matters. A new creature. Baptism signifies the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're not talking about an extraordinary baptism of the Holy Spirit that we find at the day of Pentecost when the apostles were able to speak in tongues or when the gospel came to Samaria or when it came to Ephesus and they were able to speak in tongues. We're not talking about that at all. What we are talking about, what is essential for real Christianity and for real Christians is that they know the new birth. They know that they have been born again by the Spirit of the living God. That's what he's talking about. And that's inward. It's not external. It's easy to go to the Bible and notice that they are the thief on the cross when he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He was never baptized. He never sat to the Lord's Supper. He never became a church member. Yet he's in glory. Why, friends? Because he didn't have the externals, but he had the internal. He had the reality in his heart. He had been baptized in the Spirit. He looked to Christ and he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, a lovely verse. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about. He is not despising the sacraments. Far from it. He's putting them in the right place. He recognizes that they are e external and they point to something internal. And this is what we must have. And that's what the Galatians must have. And that's the reality that all of us must know. This is real Christianity. And so many people, even in our own denomination are taken up with externals. It would be easy to go to other denominations and other congregations and to see their elaborate worship and to see how they get taken up with the externals, with the kernels of Christianity, and they know nothing of the internal reality. But we must preach to ourselves. We must confine ourselves to our own selves and examine ourselves. Do we know the inner reality of the Holy Spirit? Have we ever been cut to the heart? Have we ever been washed away with our sins? Have our sins ever been washed away? Do we know that joy? Yes, that wonderful joy, that joy that religion cannot give us. When we have a peaceful conscience, why do we have a peaceful conscience? 
We have it because our sins have been dealt with. We have it through the new birth. We have it because we believe in Jesus. And indeed, this is the first action of someone who has been born again. He believes upon Jesus. He looks to him. He sees wonder. He sees beauty. He sees glory. He sees sufficiency in Christ. Before he despised him. Before he thought nothing of him. Now, even on the cross, with the blood flowing from his crown and from his hands and from his feet and from his side, he looks upon him and he says, isn't he wonderful? Isn't he glorious? Because he is my saviour and he suffered in my room and in my place. Real Christianity, friends, then, firstly, is not outward. It's inward. It's from the heart. It's in the heart. It affects us internally. And the externals are important. And they should not be dismissed. They should be observed. They are there for our benefit. But we don't rest upon them. Real Christianity rests upon that glorious internal work of Christ by his Spirit. Well, the second heading that I have is further to expand on what real Christianity is. Is it human or divine? Is real Christianity human or divine? Two statements here that may seem conflicting. There are many different religions in the world, but there are only two kinds of religion. There are many different religions in the world, but there are only two kinds of religion. That's true. Religion is either human or divine. Christianity is a religion, but it is the only divine religion. All other religions are human. They are the inventions of humans. Christianity alone is from God. This is what makes real Christianity intolerable. It will not tolerate any other religion. And I'm grateful for another minister who said something like this. It is because truth will not tolerate error or falsehood. Truth is intolerant. We live in a society that wants to tolerate everything. And we think that's wonderful. We think that's a virtue. But truth, which we all want and we all love, truth is intolerant. It will not stand anything else. Falsehood will, will stand for any, will accept all kinds of falsehood, but not truth. And it is the same with Christianity, which is truth. It has come from God. And therefore, Christianity will not tolerate any other religion at all, because they are all false. And therefore, the Apostle Paul here wants to emphasize that the, the message that he brought to the Galatians, that people are justified by faith and made right with God through believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ alone and not by works, he wants them to realize that the religion that he proclaimed, the message that he proclaimed, came from God. It is divine. Whereas the message that the Judaizers were bringing was a human message. 
they were talking about circumcision and the importance of it. What is circumcision? It's something that's done by humans. One human does it upon another human. It's a work of humanity. What is Christianity, real Christianity, is a work of God. This is what distinguishes Christianity from any other religion. It is solely the work of God, and someone has to rest upon the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, friends, religion is either by works or by grace. And all the other religions, they'll have their different teachings, different leaders, they'll have their different ceremonies, they'll have their different requirements, and all of these kind of things. But if you strip away all of that, you'll find it's mankind working their way, seeking to please God and to appease Him and to get themselves right by doing various things like the Judaizers here. You'll get right with God when you're circumcised. Yes, believe upon the Lord Jesus, but that's not enough. You must be circumcised. And they, they taught that you mix grace and works. You cannot. It's impossible. And the divine religion, Christianity, that has come down from heaven is a religion of grace. It is God working on behalf of mankind. It is God reconciling mankind unto himself. It is a wonderful work of God in Christ. That's the difference. As someone said, Christianity is what God has done for man. All other religions are based on what man has done to please God. And that is vital. That is fundamental, basic theology. That is real Christianity in essence. Let me read one or two verses from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to read from verses 18 to 21, where we find there, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Paul outlining and emphasizing the Christian gospel to the Corinthians, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ reminding the Corinthians that it was God who moved. It was God who was initiated it. It was God who sent his Son. It was God who did all of these things. God was in Christ reconciling the world. The world was separated. The world was happy to be separated from God, but not God. He moved. He worked. He did something glorious. Christianity is the arm of God being revealed in power and in wonder and splendor. And that splendor, friends, highlighted itself in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he had done on Calvary's tree. That's real Christianity. It's what God has done in Christ. And what's required of us is that we are to put our hope and trust and faith upon the Lord Jesus. And we're not to rely upon the externals. We are to recognize that all of these things have come to us through God, through his initiative. He saw the plight of man, and he did something wonderful and glorious. 
If you are a Christian today, your faith is in God. Your faith is in what God has done in Christ. It's not in any external sacrament. It's upon Him and upon Him alone. These people were told to be circumcised. And it was rather disingenuous of them for the Judaizers to say that to them. Because, as I said earlier, if they, kept the, if they were circumcised, they were obliged then to keep the whole law. But they themselves, the Judaizers, did not keep the whole law. They couldn't do it. But they were getting people to be circumcised. Well, as they themselves couldn't keep that same law they were required to do. And Paul highlights the reason why they were so keen to have circumcision. It was that they might be spared persecution. Their kind of Christianity was, well, we'll believe in Jesus and we'll be circumcised, therefore we'll not suffer uh, persecution. The Jews won't persecute us because we haven't abandoned Judaism. We've simply embraced Christianity with Judaism. And therefore we will escape the persecution that comes from those who truly forsake Judaism and take up Christianity. And furthermore, Judaism was a religion that was recognized by the Roman government. It was one of those, those official religions, while Christianity did not have that. And therefore, to be, to be circumcised, they would be able to escape persecution. We read 2 Corinthians 11, where Paul reminded the Corinthians of the persecutions that he suffered because he was an apostle of Christ. And this reminds us, friends, that real Christianity, which is internal, which is divine, will come with persecutions. In what form that persecutions take varies from person to person. To some people in the world, the persecution can be extreme, life-threatening. They can be thrown out of their homes. They can be thrown out of employment. They can suffer real hardship. To us here, we don't embrace that. We don't expect that. It may well come to us. It did in former times. But what we must realize is persecution will come. If our Christianity is inward, if it truly is from God, then we will experience persecution. Verse 17, for instance, from henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. This does not mean that Paul had marks through his hands or his feet similar to the marks that the Lord Jesus had on the cross. What he's simply saying there is that because of his life, because of his profession, because of the reality of his Christianity, he suffered marks of persecution. He was whipped, he was beaten, and all kinds of things that we read in Second Corinthians chapter 11. And he is reminding them that he suffered that he was persecuted because the Christianity that he preached and lived out was real Christianity. That's the Christianity we must have. In the parable of the sower, Jesus talks about those who fall away when persecution comes because the root of the matter is not in them. Real Christianity, friends, will come with persecution. These people wanted to avoid that and to glory in their flesh. In other words, they wanted an easy 
Christianity. Oh, the world wants that. Many Christians want that. By nature, we would want that. None of us likes to be persecuted. None of us likes to go through hardship. Everyone wants an easy life to a certain extent. Well, we won't find that in real Christianity. There is a price to pay for discipleship. There's not a price to pay for our salvation because Christ has paid that. But real Christianity will come with persecutions. It's inward. It's divine. And this is one of the hallmarks of it. This, will, this you will know if you have real faith. You will suffer. You will know. You will experience some kind of persecution. It comes with the territory. And they avoided this because real Christianity speaks of the cross. It speaks of the cross. Now, we're not talking about carrying any wooden cross. In my former days as a photographer, I remember someone traveling. I'm not exactly sure, but I think it was from Land's End to John O'Groats with a big wooden cross upon him. And he was walking through the area that I lived in and there were photographs of him on the road with his cross. That's not what the Apostle Paul is talking about at all when he talks about the cross. He's talking about the theology of the cross. And the theology of the cross reminds us, friends, of our sinfulness. It reminds us of our hopelessness. It reminds us of the depravity of our nature that the Son of God had to go on a cross and suffer and die in order for us to be reconciled to God, in order that that perfect plan of redemption might be brought to completion, in order that God's law might be satisfied. Christ had to go to the cross and he had to suffer a bloody death for us. And of course, that is offensive to, na to the natural man. He loves to think he's good. He loves to think he, he can contribute something to his salvation when he cannot. That's the theology of the cross. And that's what the Apostle Paul delighted in. That was his message. And that's not the message of the Judaizers. It's to be circumcised. And the theology of the cross, friends, it strips us of all our self-righteousness. It tells us no matter what kind of individuals we are, no matter our mental capacity or, or our academic brilliance or lack of brilliance, no matter our social standing, no matter our bank balance, Christ alone can save. That's the message of the cross. And to the man who's filled with the things of this world, it's offensive to him that he cannot rely upon himself and upon his achievements or upon what he is by his background or by his efforts. He cannot be saved. Christ must save. He is powerless in of himself. He must rely upon this one who came from heaven. That's what Paul delighted in. But, but verse 14, for instance, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is real Christianity. Amen. And may the Lord be pleased to bless his word to us. Let us pray together.